Good evening. Uh, many thanks for coming out to celebrate the installation and recent acquisition of Who's Afraid of Red, Yellow, and Green? So the beginning, maybe we start with food. All day well, we've been I, talking about it and <coughs> sampling it. My, my shirt is under pressure. That's all I'm saying. <laughs> hey, it's not a bad life. Feel good about it. It's good. I, as I understand it, I've been reading it. It was that moment when you're at university in Chicago. You're cooking food, curry. Curry is to be shared. It's rarely something you cook alone or for self. And you would invite fellow students or friends from Chicago over. Well, actually, it was when I was still in Canada, in uh -huh, Toronto. Okay, so, okay. Um, and that was like in my undergrad school. Uh, I found myself like, uh, you know, trying to survive. And so sure. I had to prepare my own meals, which was saving the money. But then when I was cooking curry, you can't really make curry for one person. You, you have to make a big pot of curry. And then I realized that I couldn't eat it all by myself because it's, again, mm -hmm. too boring to eat the same yeah. thing. So I invited friends to come over. And then they would just start to show up every Sunday automatically without any invitation. <laughs> and then I, you know, and that was like, you know, it wasn't as if I was a very good cook. And I still say that today. But, uh, um, yeah, it became something that was definitely ingrained into the back of my, you know, existence. And, um, and this uh, particular work in 1999, um, which I made in a group show in New York, uh, I always said, you know, that I was walking down East, uh, West Broadway to go down to look at the gallery for this show to figure out what to do. And as I was walking down West Broadway, I was thinking to myself, what am I going to do? You know, this is going to be in New York. It's the first thing I'm going to be doing. And I said to myself, I should do something really simple. And, uh, and that is just to, like, cook another mm -hmm. meal. Uh, so that's kind of, like, weirdly simple, but, you know, yeah. it's uh, the beginning. The genesis of it. And we also talked a little bit about, at the time, you were seeing Thai functional items, cooking utensils, pots, in museums, and we're being invited to think about Thai culture through these inanimate objects. Yeah. So I was, uh, after the schooling in Canada, I ended up in New York. And uh, in order to stay a bit longer, I, well, actually, I was accepted to the program at the Whitney Museum, the independent study program, but they didn't, they are not accredited, so I couldn't, you know, get a visa to stay. So I had to apply for grad school uh, just to get a visa to stay. And uh, ended up in Chicago at the Art Institute. And, of course, the Art Institute of Chicago has a big museum and a big wing of Asian art. And, and of course, within that wing, uh, a lot of Thai cultural artifacts. So I would go and sit and look at them. And at that time, you know, I mean, in the mid 80s, of course, there was already a kind of question about, you know, the question of institutional, you know, structures, right? And also the question of authenticity, question of authorship. And uh, I was looking at these objects and I said, you know, this is like things that we live with every day. It's the things we use in our daily life, you know. And uh, they, you know, the West, is looking at it as if it's uh, kind of from a different point of view, like as an object. And I was like saying to myself, I really need to retrieve these objects out of these cases and try to put life back into it. I mean, of course, this was being done through my own experiences with like the idea of fluxes, you know, art and even process work or even Gordon Matter Clark. Mm -hmm. So there are like references that is always there. But, you know, at that moment when I was looking at it, I was trying to, in a sense, find myself uh, retrieving this particular situation. Um, and um, so basically I went off and, you know, cooked the food back into the pot, kind of to say. So in a sense, 
bring it, bring in the life back to these objects that, yeah. were, that were kind of in the vitrine. Yeah, and I mean, of course, this uh, quote about the reusing, putting urinal back on the wall, you know, putting the ready-made back uh, to its use and to take the action uh, onto this object was the kind of a way of like trying to find a way to extend, you know, how I could make after the ready-made. Yeah. And, uh, and in that making, I find it to be like the use, so the action of using it. Mm -hmm. So in a, in a way, the kind of re-socializing of these objects, which leads to the next, or the framing, I guess, when I think of you uh, and the way you've been framed through history with your generation through the 90s, we have Liam Gillick, Philip Pereno, Pierre Huig, Dominique Gonzalez Forrester, and then Bouriard's framing of you all under the rubric or heading of relational aesthetics, still unwieldy, still unknowable, but essentially a kind of social arrangement of objects and people and an understanding, an, an understanding of work through the coming together or activation of a space. Um, maybe this is a direct question, but I, I just, I've always wondered how you feel about that framing or that term? Do those terms mean something to you, or it's 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 a convenient way to look at a generation of practitioners? Um, well, from my perspective, I always said I, I like the idea of relations, uh, but I don't really enjoy the aesthetics. Okay. Um, which is to say, yeah. really, I you know I'm not really looking at things aesthetically that way. Uh, and I would say I rather look at the relation and the relation, and I wouldn't aestheticize that, right? Right. Um, so I take half of it and leave the other half. <laughs> okay, we'll take relations. Um, well, this feels like a good time to look at the initial um, iteration. Where am I pointing here? The initial. Oh, so there's a picture of, uh, you could see, like, a white wall with some drawings on, on uh, you know, <laughs> made from charcoal. Yeah, yeah. Uh, the images are, like, uh, protest images and some images of uh, military and soldiers and police. And uh, there are a bunch of people in front of it. Yeah, they can see it now. I'm going to let you in on the secret. Yeah. It's, I'm, it's I'm going to describe it without looking at it? it. Without looking. You can do that. I need it. I value aesthetics. Oh, there's no people in it. Yeah, yeah. Yeah. But I always say, when you photograph my work, please photograph it with people in it. Yes. Because, again, there, that's what it's more about. It's really not about, I mean, it's, of course, partly about the image that's on the wall, partly about the cooking that's in front. But really, for me, what's very important is actually people in it. Yes. There we go. There Images we go. of people. So this is the original installation, 2010, at the Tonson Gallery in Bangkok. Um, again, the title is Who's Afraid of Red, Yellow, and Green? And maybe we can address first the title, the reason for that title. Um, you'll see it next door. It's kind of apparent in terms of the different food that's prepared. But maybe you can talk a little bit about what was happening politically at that time. In Bangkok. Um, well, that was um, at that moment, uh, and we've been, you know, in that time period, probably over four or five years, been kind of shifting between one one group of protests to another, for one reason uh, or the other, and and somehow, you know, people have taken on a kind of idea of color as as part of their kind of stance. So there's uh, the yellow shirts and there are the red shirts. And uh, and they have, and of the yellow shirts are, I guess, seen as like kind of royalists at this moment. And they're more urban in a way, in terms of like the, you know, perspective. Um, and the red shirts are seen as rural and, you know, people and, um, yeah, from the rural area, and more like a grassroots uh, situation. I mean, they're both grassroots in that sense, but you know, very, from very different, in a way, uh, maybe economic background. But it's not really true. It's a kind of mix of everyone. But, but somehow there's a kind of divide, and um, 
people from one side would protest and then the other, and then take somebody, you know, to, to topple one government and then the other group would come out and so and we are still today uh, presently still trying to figure out like what the situation is. It's very we just had an election and we still I think I, I don't know the last time I looked that we haven't formed a government yet. So uh, so there are question marks all the time. Uh, but at that moment, uh, when I decided to make this work, there was a very big protest from the Red uh, Shirt Movement, um, and they occupied the central of Bangkok. And eventually, the military moved in, and you know a lot of things got burned down. A lot of people were lost their lives in it. But at that moment, um, and that's uh, decided to make this work, which was actually a gallery which is situated literally like maybe like 500 yard meters away from where the protests was happening. Um, and it was already a time when we could all say that, you know, everyone was quite divided. The artists were all divided. People were taking sides and, you know, trying to choose the color. Um, and I felt the need to, in a way, address that. Um, and, and to start with it, uh, I decided to bring all the imageries back, actually, from when the first kind of really, you know, movement, protest movement and student movement came out, uh, which was in the early 70s, which was really the first time where the people, and uh, mainly students, but the people came out and and made their voice heard and made change. There was a government change. And from that time on, you know, people started to come out. And a lot of the people who are fractured at this moment now used to protest together. They used to be on the same side. They used to march together against the military. And so in that way, I felt, you know, the need to kind of rethink, like, where we were coming from and what we were fighting for. Um, so, in Thai cuisine, if you've been to Thai restaurants, um, there are different kinds of curries. And the basic, very basic, you know, curries that we eat in our everyday is usually, uh, there's a green curry, which is, of course, made from green chilies. There's a red curry made from red chili. And there's a yellow curry, which is, uh, I mean, in a way, like, you know, like it's sound. And so I decided to bring these curries together as a, you know, to kind of as a background to like what I was thinking, like how do we think of this situation and how we live together or how we eat together and how is it that we're not, it's not possible to think beyond this kind of color division. Um, the title, of course, comes from um, play of, uh, you know, Barnett Newman's painting, uh, Who's Afraid of Red, Yellow, and Blue? And I think Barnett Newman was talking about Kandinsky, right? But so there's a kind of relationship to art, but also in that sense, the layer of it was really about how do we look and how are we looking at each other from what whichever side of the divide, um, and how can we rethink this perhaps through the meal, perhaps through remembering our history and or the place we came from. Um, so the idea was that uh, the images would be drawn and we, uh, I had a friend who went and did, of course, research and brought all these pictures together and they're all images from the newspaper. So they were published pictures and most of them, of course, were pictures that are in our memory. And um, and then I gave it to young artists who I'd been working with uh, who came to make the drawings on the walls. And, um, and of course, they would just look through the pile and then they would decide which image they would want to draw and they would just put it on. Depends on how they want it. And the idea was that they would keep drawing all the images over a period of time and at some point, once they covered the white wall, they would like then layer the next layers of images over until at some point the walls would just go black, right? And that would be, you know, in a way, like all the layers that one could 
possibly make. Um, and the food was, of course, always there, you know, being boiling and cooking, and people would come and sit and eat and spend time. You could spend time just to eat. You can just spend time to cook. But you also could spend time drawing and or look at the people drawing the images. So it was a lot about like trying to bring people together to you know spend time together and think a little bit about the situation. Which brings us on a little bit. You you mentioned fluxus and the happenings and such that kind of set up these kind of spaces. And I was and we'll move to um, the version that we have here at the Hershorn that's been um, installed and worked on this week by our artists and with our caterers today. And this kind of score or equation or formula for the work kind of moves from Bangkok to here. And it comes with new images. This is another place. This is a site for demonstrations. This is a site of historic protest. And it was your decision, and maybe you could talk a little bit about about that decision to include images of this new site and this new history and how they're kind of remixed or collaged together. Yeah, um, so before I started to work with this idea of, you know, drawing murals, um, I had been working, I mean, already before that, since 2000, maybe since George W. Bush was elected. Uh, <laughs> I was looking at the newspaper, I would read the newspaper when I had free time. And um, I started to notice that there were like a lot of people coming out to protest, right? There was a lot of people coming out to demonstrate for one reason or another, one cause or another. And I started to collect the imagery from the newspaper so I could clip it out. And uh, I would then at some point later on, I gave it to some younger Thai artists that I knew who were just coming out of school. And I asked them to like make the drawings from these images. And partly was the interest in this idea of people coming together to make, you know, to manifest their, you know, voice. Uh, and, and also I was interested in this, yeah, idea of uh, gathering uh, because I was working with, you know, bringing people together. So I was interested in that. And uh, and then I wanted to give these younger Thai artists at that moment like some work because they were coming out with no real support and uh, I wanted to keep them working close to art so I asked them to draw make the draw drawings so they may they would make the drawings and whenever the drawings would sell uh, it would come back to uh, support the foundation that I have up in the north of Thailand so it was a kind of like the idea of the work, but also a kind of economical, you know, structure. Um, and then when I, later on, I was asked to do a project in Mexico, in Mexico City at the university, um, as part of a group show, I asked them that we would uh, think about drawing, like, the images as murals. Partly because, of course, in the context of the Mexican relationship, there's that history of, of, of murals. So I had a group of university students came and they, of course, started to make drawings. And at that moment, we had a kind of like just collections of like, almost like the idea of the history of manifestation. So from everywhere. And in the way that kind of fed into like the work I did later on in Bangkok. Um, so when we come back to this, place in this context I you know and generally when I make work I always usually think very much about where I'm making it and very much about the context it's in who's coming who I'm dealing with who's looking at it and so in that sense um, having to reanimate this work which was really made originally with a certain kind of place and time um, I decided that, you know, to recontextualize it a little bit by reintroducing images, of course, of, uh, of the local situation, which, of course, is about, like, the protests that happens, you know, here in this particular space, in a way. Um, 
And maybe some of those images, we can see here there's an image of a horse, which is an um, early image of the women's suffragette movement. There are other protest images, Million Man March, uh, Women's March. So it kind of blends decades as well as I believe the Bangkok version did a little bit that started in the 70s. Again, thinking through how these things change as they kind of move from site to site, here we have um, the curries that are made in DC. And I was really kind of, I think in that first iteration, you were there <coughs> cooking and preparing the food. And here you're collaborating with another kitchen or restaurant and working out um, what that is. And it's, it's a kind of very generous engagement with or collaboration, so to speak. Um, and it'll be interesting to see how it's kind of viewed here. I think there's a New York Times headline, Curry is Art. <laughs> it's still a thing. It's still a thing. I don't know. 20 or, 20 or so years on. Um, so here are some of the murals. This is one of the images from the Million Man March. And I think what's been interesting to me and Recreate when we're talking about it is that although there's a chorus of images, the artists that have picked up the chokehold to draw it all have very different registers. So there's, very, there's some that are very graphic, there are some that are kind of differently or naively handled in an interesting way. And somehow that kind of blend of different voices or the, the, the hand as you describe it becomes another kind of communal activity. Sorry, there was no question in that. That was me just talking. <laughs> um, back to that. No, I, and I, I, I yeah. just want to say a little bit that, of course, in a way, I also keep it open to the fact that, um, you know, visitors or any other number of audience who come to this situation uh, has the possibili possibility to, of course, participate, you know. Okay. Um, and in this context, we have a kind of uh, overhead projector, so the images get projected onto the wall, which actually, you know, makes it a lot easier for everyone to, like, get up and start to work on it because, uh, you know, you just have to follow the, the imagery. So we should also talk about the, the other component to the show. Um, Rickert was interested in... Again, a little like taking the pot out and activating it. We have two rooms with one of your films, Long New Visits His Neighbors, but also a series of films organized or curated by Apichat Pong, Virus Thakur. And it's six young Bangkok-based uh, filmmakers that really kind of set the mood for contemporary Thailand, for that city, and create a kind of another aliveness, so to speak, for the installation of your, um, of your work. Maybe you could talk a little bit about, um, and this was the image of the lovely Carl Homquist, the series of films that you've made that are portraits of peers, often John Giorno, Carl here, and then also um, people that you've met through making work, I believe you met this person in Thailand and they were working on with you on one of your houses and he had a certain energy and spirit yeah. and you wanted to follow that. Yeah, no, I mean, um, so I don't live in Bangkok, right? I live uh, in the northern provincial city and, um, and partly, yeah, I just didn't want to live in a big city. And um, and northern Thailand in Chiang Mai, there's uh, it's an old culture, and there are a lot of artists there, and it's really kind of like in a sense it's an alternative place, uh, you know, from the center. And in that process, I met a lot of uh, people locally who I've been working with through the foundation that I have with my friend. Um, and Lung Niu was somebody who was in our periphery, he was in our neighborhood, and he was an older elderly person who would be a part of the team, but he was always like kind of given a kind of a light to work because, you know, and I would watch him around the house and whatever he's doing, and I, I really, I don't know, I was kind of uh, taken by his spirit and mannerism and his being, and um, so one day I asked him like if it was all right if I could come over and film him and being the generous person he was, he said, yes, come, 
you know. <laughs> and uh, then we started to follow him around and start to film him. But what I, I, what was important for me actually was kind of this relationship, you know, in terms of like understanding that, you know, as much as there's strife and division and things, life goes on and, you know, you know, somebody like him, you know, lives on very little and survives on very little. But that's what's really important, you know, and and I felt like the need to, in a way, capture that um, because part of the kind of strife and division was kind of like about certain kind of I would say maybe class structure or a certain kind of uh, prejudice towards like, you know, people you don't deal with every day. Um, so, you know, part of the problem for me in terms of like the politics was that, you know, the people in the city, you know, people in the urban area felt that they were, I mean, there were like moments where people were saying things like, we have the right to decide about what happens, and of course the people out in the herb, you know in the in the rural area felt you know taken you know like felt insulted by that relationship and i I understand that because I think that you know there are yeah there's a great gap in terms of wealth and and privilege and all that um but in this man, if we follow him, we'll understand what that what it means to be out there surviving with your own dignity and you know so it it was important for me to like record that and in a way yeah as a film um that hopefully everybody would get to see and understand that you know you can't dismiss you know just because the fact that you don't see them or see the other that you could just dismiss them from your own you know Position. So that was like partly why it was important for me to make this film, and partly why it's important for me to like have it here. It does, yeah. It does kind of mirror that idea of the the urban, the city, the center. Those images often take place in cities, and then you have this very quiet couple of days of this guy who's kind of politically involved in his interactions in relation to class, but has a different kind of centeredness um we are coming very close to the end that passed very <laughs> quickly your voice held up that's pretty amazing um sadly we don't have time for a q a we don't we don't no we've got like i was told if i wasn't <clears throat> on the stage one that question was one quick maybe we'll do one question who should we do one question with here we go Make it a good one, no pressure. Do we? <laughs> should we run up? How do you find artists in uh, young adults? Really How do I find young? They're of all ages. <laughs> <laughs> um, well, actually, Mark should answer that. Um, I think uh, everyone, m most of everyone who are here, I mean, are involved with the museum, I think, in one aspect or another, or not. Okay. Some are. I mean, the we have artists that work on staff that um, work on murals, and they reached out to a network. Yeah, and see. and so, but at any rate, we had dinner together last night, and uh, there was, you know, twenty of us, and I got to, you know, be with everyone and realize that actually, and I think amongst themselves also realize that they haven't all met each other or known each other. So in that sense, for me, it was quite nice to feel that, oh, you know, there's this thing that I've done that somehow could bring them together, even if they hadn't met each other before, and perhaps uh, form a new relationship out of this situation. Thank you. Thank you, Rick. Let's put this.